Welcome to California Unearthed. Today we are going to be looking at 10 haunted places here in California. I'm only going to go through a very brief history of each one and why they are haunted. So if you want more information on any of these 10, definitely go visit them for yourself. I plan on doing it. I'm going to make a full video on all 10 of these at some point. So I will definitely go visit. I suggest you do as well. So let's go unearth some haunted places here in California. This is only 10. There's a whole lot more than 10 here in California. Let's go. Number 10, Sacramento Old City Cemetery. Cemeteries can be the creepiest and scariest places to visit, but at the same time, some of the most beautiful as well. The Sacramento Old City Cemetery happens to be one of those cemeteries. It is said it is the most haunted place in the city of Sacramento, along with being the oldest established cemetery in the city of Sacramento, dating back to 1849. With 172 years of history, you know there has to be some stories. John Sutter Jr., the founder of the city of Sacramento donated 10 acres for the cemetery in 1849. John Sutter Jr. is the son of famous John Sutter from Sutter's Fort. The cemetery is designed in a Victorian garden style, which was very popular in the mid to late 1800s. It wasn't long after its opening it had its first interments. In 1850, cholera epidemic broke out in Sacramento killing over 600 people. 600 of those were buried in a mass grave at the Sacramento Old City Cemetery. Like I said, they were the first to be interred there. Today, there is over 25,000 people buried in the cemetery. Some of the more prominent people there are John Sutter Jr. himself, E.B. Crocker, who was an attorney and art collector, and also the brother of Charles Crocker, one of the big four in the Transcontinental Railroad. And speaking of the big four, one of those is buried in the cemetery as well. Mark Hopkins is also buried here. Also buried here is William Stephen Hamilton, the son of Alexander Hamilton, three California governors, and many early mayors of the city of Sacramento. Many changes have taken place over the last 172 years. Today, the cemetery covers approximately 30.44 acres. With age comes ghost stories, and there are a few that haunt this cemetery. The most popular ghost is that of former train engineer and hero, William Brown. It's believed that he died while saving hundreds of lives in a train accident, and he is commonly seen simply standing over his own grave in a black suit. A very popular ghost in the cemetery is a 12-year-old girl named Mae Woodsley. She died in 1879 and is often seen playing around the cemetery or walking to or from her old home. You can often hear her giggling or speaking if you listen carefully enough. She may be talking to you. There's also even the spirit of a black pit bull dog that likes to roam around the cemetery and follow visitors. When the dog is approached or the dog approaches you, he simply vanishes. Many people have seen all three. You want to try your luck and see if you can be visited by one of these three? Number 9. Griffith Park, L.A. Zoo you would think a zoo was an odd place to have a haunting, but just going to visit, you'll understand why. The Griffith Park LA Zoo was turned into a picnic area when it closed in 1966. If you go to have a picnic there, you can feel the eerie creepiness running up and down your spine. This was not the first zoo in Los Angeles. That distinction goes to the East Lake Zoo, built in 1885 in East Los Angeles. That closed in 1912 due to cramped conditions and mismanagement. The Griffith Park LA Zoo was built in 1912 on Griffith J. Griffith's default ostrich farm. It started with a total of 15 animals. 
In the early 1930s, the zoo was expanded as part of President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. The zoo had included caved enclosures with steel bars, which had been commonplace in zoos in the day. Having drawn 2 million visitors per year, the zoo often had been on the end of criticism for its small size, especially when the city of Los Angeles was growing by the late 1950s. The city had passed a bond to construct a new zoo that would cost upwards to $8 million. The zoo would be constructed just two miles from the Griffith Park LA Zoo. In 1966, the new zoo opened, leading to the closure of the Griffith Park Zoo, becoming home to picnic tables and benches for park visitors, which are still there to this day. Griffith Park was once owned by rancher Don Antonio Feliz, who died in 1863 of smallpox. But before dying, a local politician, Don Antonio Cornell, was drawing up Feliz's will which was a ruse as a politician and his attorney were looking to deprive Felice's family of the land. Upon learning of this, Felice's niece, Donna Petrella, allegedly declared a curse on the politician, his family, anyone who ever owned the land. The attorney involved in the swindling of the property was later shot to death by an unknown assailant. The next owner, was Leon Lucky Baldwin, who wasn't so lucky after all. He wanted to start a cattle farm. However, those plans were shot down immediately when his cattle contracted a disease and ended up dying. His crops didn't fare much better. His crops were destroyed by fire and pests. When Griffith took over the property, prior to converting it to a park, a nasty thunderstorm rolled through Los Angeles and caused major flood damage including lightning strikes that downed a large tree on property. Some of his ranch hands, employed by Griffith, said to have seen a shadowy figure cheering and hollering during the storm. They believed that figure to be Felice himself, cheering on what may have been another failure of another property owner trying to use the land for his own benefit. During the Great Depression, workers were on hand to make renovations and changes to Griffith Park. On one such day, during the New Deal project, more than 30 civilian workers were killed when a wildfire swept through the park. When Griffith donated the park to Los Angeles County, the curse followed with it. Forty years after the Great Depression, a couple visiting the park were killed when a falling tree crushed them to death. Walking around the old zoo during the day, can be a little creepy, but at night, when there isn't very many people around, the zoo itself is a site of many eerie hauntings. According to locals and visitors, hauntings at the zoo and at Griffith Park itself are commonplace. It is told at night, some people will visit the old zoo and hear the sounds of animals in distress. Considering that the animals were held in cages, it may have been a possibility of abuse, but sadly, allegations were never brought up on abuse. But walking about the cages, you can tell they're way too small for any animal in captivity. Like any other major park in a metropolitan area, Griffith Park has seen its fair share of murders and disposal of bodies amongst the park. It has given way to numerous homicide investigations. So the ghostly figures that people have seen over the years, could that be of Felice, animals, or any of the multiple deaths that have happened around the park over the years? You decide. Number 8. Alcatraz Island Alcatraz Island is in the San Francisco Bay, only a mile and a quarter from San Francisco, but it might as well be a hundred miles. The only way on and off the island is by boat. If you tried to swim across, the water is chilling. Currents are strong, not to mention the sharks. Alcatraz is known as a federal prison that housed criminals such as Al Capone and Machine Gun Kelly, but it had a long history before it was a federal prison. Early 
early Spanish explorers in the 1500s noted the atmosphere on the tiny island was heavy and depressing. It is believed that there are Native American burial grounds on the island. Human bones and artifacts have been discovered buried on the island. People who visit the island have experienced dark sensations long before the prison was ever built. Members of the Ohlone tribe told tales about the island and believed it was a gathering spot for evil spirits. They had such distaste for the area that it's believed natives who broke tribal laws were sent to the island as punishment. The United States government took possession of the island in the 1850s by making it Fort Alcatraz, which started in 1859. During the Civil War, the fort held Civil War prisoners and citizens accused of treason. The U.S. Army made the island a military prison in 1868 up to the early 1930s and a maximum security federal prison in 1934 through 1963 which was thought to be unescapable due to the cold water, current, and sharks in the bay. The prison was closed due to cost. In 1969, the natives of multiple tribes occupied Alcatraz in the name of freedom and Native American civil rights. In 1972, Alcatraz became a national park. Alcatraz held 1,500 prisoners in its 30-year run. 36 prisoners tried to escape in 14 escape attempts. Six were shot and killed during their escape. Two drowned and five are listed as missing and presumed dead. Although three of those five may have made it to shore. Frank Morris, John Anglin, and Clarence Anglin, who escaped in 1962 on makeshift rafts. The rafts have been found on shore, but no sign of the three men. Did they drown or did they survive? It has long been a discussion. Along with any prison comes death. With death comes spirits and hauntings. And Alcatraz is no different. There's certain parts of the prison not even prisoners want to go. D-Block is one of those places and is now considered the most haunted place in the prison. It was known as The Hole, held five solitary confinement cells reserved for the most poorly behaved. The cells were extremely cold and prisoners were forced to strip naked and their mattresses were removed each morning, forcing them to either stand or sit on the cold floor. One of these cells was known as the Oriental, and unlike the other solitary cells, prisoners were left completely in the dark with only a hole in the floor to relieve themselves. At one point in the 1940s, an inmate began screaming as soon as he was locked in the cell. The guards ignored him, believing he was just upset about the conditions. The next morning, the guards found him dead. Autopsies revealed he died of strangulation, not inflicted by himself. Was it a guard who killed him or a ghost? possibly that of Ruffles McKay since he had stayed in that cell. We'll never know. But many report feeling uncomfortable and tingly when entering his cell 14D. It is colder than any of the other cells. A ghost hunter investigation in cell 12D just down the hall reported feeling icy fingers upon their neck when entering. All prisons have their riots or their hostage situations, and Alcatraz is no different. In May of 1946, the Battle of Alcatraz lasted two days and killed five people. Bank robber Bernard Coy carefully observed the guards for many, many months before planning his escape attempt. In May of 1946, he and five other men managed to break into the gun cage in cell block C and stole the guards' keys. Unfortunately for them, the key that led them out of the building was not on the key ring. The men took several guards hostage and killed two before the Marines were called. Three of the attempted escapees eventually became trapped in a utility passageway where they were killed by gunfire. The event lasted two days and became known as the Battle of Alcatraz, the bloodiest escaped attempt in the history of the prison. Although the passageway is now concealed from visitors' view, 
too with a heavy door. Bangs and clangs are heard, but disappear once the door is open. Many believe that the ghosts of the three men who were killed in the passageway are trying to speak to the visitors. Another area of the prison that is haunted is that of the C Block Laundry Room. Abe Maldwez was also known as the Butcher. He was a hitman on the outside. Prison records indicate he had in fact died in the laundry room when he was brutally murdered by another inmate. Mysterious incidences from the same room include the heavy smell of smoke in the air and nothing's burning. The apparition of a balding man who, as described, is Abe Maldwez. The Alcatraz prison also includes a dungeon that holds many lost souls who died alone and are still screaming. Alcatraz was all about punishment and what the prisoners went through is a horrible story in itself. Underneath a block is an area called the dungeon. These catacomb-like basement areas were left over from the days when Alcatraz was a military fort and were used as punishment areas for those that deserved worse than the whole. Prisoners were stripped naked, chained to the wall in a standing position, and given very little food. While the screams of the inmates, unfortunate enough to spend time there, couldn't be heard in the rest of the prison. They can still be heard today. A worker claims to have heard a horrible scream coming from the dungeon, but found no one there. Even ghost hunters heard noises in the area and received an audible no when asked if the noise could be made again. Alcatraz is definitely one of California's most haunted places. There are many, many other stories to tell. It's definitely worth a visit to the island. Just don't get left there alone. Number 7. The Queen Mary The Queen Mary was once a luxurious ocean liner, but now sits in Long Beach and has been since 1967. It is now a hotel and a major attraction, but it has a long history of carrying passengers and military personnel and also is known to be haunted. Cunard White Star Line began construction on the Queen Mary in 1930 in Clydesbank, Scotland, but the Great Depression hit and work had to slow down. But on May 27, 1936, the Queen Mary departed from Southampton, England, embarking on her maiden voyage. She boasted five dining rooms, lounges, two cocktail bars, swimming pool, grand ballroom, even a squash court, and a small hospital. The ship had class, elegance, in style. In September of 1939 in New York, she went from a passenger ship liner to a military ship for World War II until 1947. She was painted gray and renamed the Gray Ghost to haul service members back and forth across the Atlantic. The ship carried some 2.2 million passengers in peacetime and some 810,000 military personnel during World War II. But due to airlines, Increasing in popularity and ship travel becoming obsolete, the Queen Mary went to Long Beach as its final home in December of 1967, and that's where she now stays. She has had over 5 million visitors since mooring in 1967, but the hauntings are what really attract the visitors. It is one of the top 10 haunted places in America. Among the ghosts reportedly seen hanging around is an engineer who died in the ship's engine room. Lady in White, various children located throughout the ship, including the first class pool, some of the most haunted areas in the ship our stateroom B340. In 1948, a British third-class passenger, Walter J. Adamson, passed away in the room, and the details of his death are unknown. Later, in 1966, a woman staying in the room was woken up when the bed covers were pulled off of her, and she saw a man standing there at the foot of her bed. She screamed and rang for the steward, but the man apparently vanished in thin air. Years 
years later, guests staying in the room have reported hearing someone knocking at the door in the middle of the night and seeing bedroom lights mysteriously turn on and off. Even the hotel's maid started complaining they would find the bathroom water running even when no one had been staying in the room. And one reported that the bed covers were pulled off right after she had made the bed. The room was closed to guests for many years. It has since been reopened for anyone looking for a ghostly experience. The Mortinia Room. In 1989, two women were sent to clean this lounge for a VIP reception. When they entered the room, they found a passenger sitting on the chair in the middle of the room on the dance floor who didn't say a word. When a third woman came in to help with the cleaning, she remarked that the passenger was staring and asked her to move. As the employees started to call security, the passenger faded right in front of their eyes, a feat all three women reported seeing at the same time. The Mayfair Room was once the ship's beauty salon, but now are offices for the hotel. In 2001, a member of the accounting staff came in early to work at 5.30 a.m. to be exact and simply felt like something was off. She went about her office tasks before sitting down at her desk and feeling unusually cold. Later, she felt someone brush up against the back of her chair, but no one was there. Just minutes after that, the woman saw a transparent figure in white walk across the room and push through the door. Needless to say, the employee grabbed her stuff and fled until her code workers arrived. The first class swimming pool, this is where a lot of apparitions have been seen, this now abandoned pool on board was once the epitome of luxury with an illuminated fountain, a mother of pearl ceiling, and the pool is no longer in use because of California code issues, but that doesn't stop it from being one of the more haunted places on the ship. People have reported seeing a number of ghosts here, including a young woman in a tennis skirt walking downstairs and disappearing behind a pillar, a woman in an old wedding gown, next to the pool with a little boy in a suit and a cloud of steam appears out of nowhere along with a little girl in a blue and white dress who disappear in an instant. Boiler room number four. Several people have reported seeing a little girl in this area sometimes sucking her thumb and sometimes with a doll in hand. Hatch door number 13. This hatch door is known as Shaft Alley and it was a site of a gruesome accident where a crewman crushed to death. One night in 1966, the watertight doors in the engine and boiler room were ordered to be closed. About five minutes later, 18-year-old crew member from Yorkshire was found crushed in the door of the hatch, number 13, trapped with his arms pinned to his side. While the man was freed and carried to the hospital, it was too late. His ghost is regularly seen around the area now, with people reporting the sound of someone running behind them and whistling. Others have noticed that spots of grease that looked like fingerprints appeared on their faces. Some have seen a figure of a bearded man in a blue coveralls that looks just like the man who died died out of the corner of their eyes and several people saw an engineer wandering the hallways asking if guest has seen his wrench but when they went back to find him he had disappeared this is truly one haunted cruise liner and definitely worth a trip to long beach to go visit and see if you can find a ghost of your own number six ghost town of Bodie, california the ghost town of Bodie, california sits at an elevation of 8,379 feet. It is on the National Register of Historic Places and has been a California State Historic Park since 1962. Going to the town of Bodie is like stepping back in time to the Old West. Bodie is a gold mining ghost town. At one time had a population of over 10,000 people. Only a small part of the town survives, preserved in a state of arrested decay. Interiors remain as they were left, in stock shelves with goods, a prime location for ghosts and spirits. Bodie was the richest gold strike in California history, 
with up to $100 million of gold being taken out. This made Bodie known as the most lawless town in California. Wild and tough, only the strongest and toughest survived. Bodie is named after Waterman S. Bodie, a.k.a. William Bodie, who had discovered a small amount of gold in the hills just north of Mono Lake in 1859. In 1875, a mine caved in revealing pay dirt, which led to the purchase of the mine by the Standard Company. In 1877, people flocked to Bodie, much like they did with any gold strike after the gold rush of 1849 out of Sacramento. It transformed a small little town of just a few dozen into a boom town of thousands. Once held about 2,000 buildings, 60 of which were saloons. Miners were not the only residents of Bodhi, though. There was a Chinatown, and much like a lot of towns in the late 1800s, the Chinese were not welcome. And what was left of the Paiute Indians also resided in Bodhi, working and living. As per any gold strike in 1881, only four short years later, the gold was deplenished, leaving mining companies, miners, and businesses bankrupt. By 1886, the population of Bodie had dropped to 1,500. 1890, a fire destroyed a lot of Bodie, but once mining techniques and electricity were invented, there was a reinsurgence of gold mining just north of Bodie until 1932, when another fire wiped out all but 10% of the town of Bodie. Bodie lasted only a few more years into the 1940s before everybody abandoned the town, leaving it to what we see today. With the town of Bodie comes hauntings. The most unique and unusual curse is upon the town of Bodie. What's funny about this curse, it was made up by the park service itself to prevent people from taking or stealing objects from the state park. It has been said that if you take an object, even as small as a rock, from the state park of Bodie, you will have bad luck from that point on until the item is returned. The park service gets thousands of letters each year with items included and notes apologizing for taking said item, explaining all of the cursed bad luck they've had since they've gotten home with the said item they've taken from Bodie, California. Is it just curious that they're having bad luck? Or are the ghosts of Bodie helping the state park preserve and protect Bodie? Bodie has had its last citizens die unexpectedly. An ornery, horrible man named Ed shot his Indian wife in a drunken rage. She later died in a hospital. Three men took the law into their own hands, tied and laid Ed in a creek. They kicked him until he went limp and unconscious. He drowned in the creek. After the murder, Ed's spirit appeared two months later to each of the three men, shaking his fists at them. Each of the three killers died untimely, strange deaths. They began to die in rapid succession of strange diseases. One died from a huge gash in his face. Another died from a hematoma that blew up in his head like a balloon. And the third just disappeared and died somewhere in the ravine. But it's just not the ghost of Ed that is in Bodie. It's not just Ed that haunts Bodie. One of Bodie's largest homes is the most haunted, the John S. Kane residence. is haunted by a woman scorned. John was a wealthy man and chose to hire a Chinese woman who was to be his assistant, maintaining the house and caring for his family. Rumors soon spread that this woman was having an affair with John, which led to her losing her job, being outcast by the community, and sadly taking her own life. Since her death, the ghost of this woman has been said to occupy the home. Poltergeist activities have been reported. The woman's apparition has been seen staring out the windows, and adults who have stayed within the property have been physically attacked by an unseen presence. The Gregory House is another reportedly haunted house. The spirit of an older, unknown female. She has been seen all around the house, usually busy knitting, but not bothering anybody. 
The old Mendocine home also has many paranormal stories linked to it as well. Years ago, this was a family home, and the disembodied laughter of children are still heard playing in the yard. The ranger who now lives in the home believes the spirits of these children remain and continue to play tricks on him, like pulling off his bed sheets while he is sleeping. The ghostly smells of homemade Italian cooking also randomly appear within the home. Any gold mines of the time were not safe. Accidents happened all the time, from cave-ins to dynamite explosions. Today, rangers have reported hearing voices and screams coming from the mines. There also has said to be an entity of a white mule which died on the job after having his back broke. The mines are truly haunted. All big towns have a cemetery. It's usually the prime place for a haunting. Bodie is no different. The spirit of Evelyn Myers haunts around her angel-shaped headstone. She died tragically at the age of three when she was struck in the head with a pickaxe accidentally. Her ghost has been seen by many children within the cemetery who informed their parents of the little girl wanting to play with them. These are only just a few hauntings in Bodhi. With this long history of lawlessness and tough living, there are so many other hauntings that happen here. This is definitely a place to visit. Number 5. Moaning Caverns Moaning Caverns is a majestic cave millions of years old located in Calaveras County, near Valcido, in the heart of the gold country. You can say it was discovered in 1851 by gold miners, but it has long been known as an interesting geological feature by the native people. Its name comes from the moaning sound that echoes out of the cave's entrance, luring people and animals to the opening. Much like the mermaids in sea legend and lore, the main chamber is known as the largest single cave chamber in California. The massive chamber reaches over 180 feet before funneling into smaller passageways. With a 20 to 30 foot thick ceiling, the opening area inside the chamber is in fact big enough to hold the Statue of Liberty minus the pedestal there is only one natural entrance and exit in and out of the chamber. It is a 30-foot vertical chimney dropping into the center of the chamber. This does make for commercial entry a little difficult. So dynamite was used in the early 1900s to expand a natural crack in the ground so that they could put stairs down to the bottom. In 1921, a narrow wooden staircase ended at a flat platform 65 feet underground. From there, a 10-story spiral staircase led down to a second platform, the base of the chamber. And if you're brave enough, you can go down off trail to the other passageways, which reach down to a depth of 410 feet. Are you brave enough? This is an archaeological site as well, where some of the oldest human remains known in America have been found. Human deposits about 12,000 years old were found here. The skull of a human is on display. Nevertheless, there are also many other human bones and animal bones that have been discovered. This is only scratching the surface of what may be down there. Moaning Caverns has its share of ghost stories. The first is that of the Tommyknockers. These were three miners who fell and died in Moaning Caverns. One other miner that almost fell in made sure that no more miners would fall into the gaping hole by roping off the entrance. People have seen ghostly miner figures near and around Moaning Caverns, and they've also heard what sounds like a hammer hitting rock. Sometimes the sound echoes everywhere around Moaning Caverns. People say that the sound originates from the cave itself to warn people of the danger and to stay away and keep clear. These are known as Tommy Knockers. One of the most interesting stories is that of Chip, the saber-toothed tiger. That's right, saber-toothed tiger. Some witnesses have seen a ghostly saber-toothed tiger near the cave entrance. It is believed that the tiger fell in the cave. The tiger is known to just sit and stare 
at witnesses, not to attack, but just to stare. People have noticed one of his fangs has a big chip in it, hence the name Chip, the saber-toothed tiger. There are other prehistoric people who fell into the caverns and died as well. Archaeologists don't know how many bones of animals and humans are at the bottom of moaning caverns. They've only scratched the surface. Is the saber-toothed tiger one of those? Another really interesting ghostly story is that of Zyra Miner, a.k.a. Bill Miner, or the Gray Fox. He was also known as the Gentleman Bandit. The Gray Fox, after robbing the stagecoach, came to Moaning Caverns to stash his loot amongst the rocks. One week later, he came back and his loot was gone. One particular witness, Maureen Lehman, claims that she has seen a ghostly figure of a man looking through the weeds, shrubberies, and rocks for something and never finding it. He is wearing a gray cowboy hat and a gray jacket, which looks like it's from the 1800s. He was known to look at Marin and then fade away. Marin will never forget that experience or the gentleman's face. This is where the story gets very creepy. Eight years later, Marin walked into an antique store where she saw a ghostly photograph of the gentleman that she witnessed searching amongst the rocks at Moaning Caverns. Upon further investigation, she found out the gentleman's name was the Gray Fox. She purchased the photograph and has put it on her mantle as a reminder of the ghostly figure she saw that day at Moaning Caverns. It's not just the miners, stagecoach robbers, and saber-toothed tigers that have been seen. People have also claimed to see the local Miwok Indian tribe marching along the river. The river is called the Calaveras River. Calaveras meaning skull. And like I said, there is many skulls in Moaning Caverns. There's also many skulls along the river. The Miwok Indian tribe was slaughtered by the Spanish soldiers near the river and near Moaning Caverns itself. Would you like to go to Moaning Caverns and see if you can find a ghostly figure? I know I would. Number four, Preston Castle. This absolutely beautiful building sits southeast of Sacramento in the foothills of the gold country in the town of Ione. This is truly a magnificent school. Or is it a prison? You decide. The school was proposed and named after State Senator Edward Myers Preston. Senator Preston wanted the school to be in Folsom, but things changed. It ended up in Ione. Preston Castle was opened on 290 acres in June of 1894 as Preston School of Industry, a reform school for boys. The school is a Romanesque revival style of architecture, which makes the building look more like a school, not a prison. It is known as the oldest and well-known reform school in U.S. history. Here, boys could learn a trade. The large acreage of land allowed the boys to raise their own crops, raise their own livestock, and learn farming trades. There is a paint shop, a bakery, and even a cobbler shop. Whatever the boys wanted to learn, they had it. The school started with seven wards, minors under the care of the state, but not necessarily juvenile offenders. They were transferred from San Quentin Prison. In 1960, the state planned to demolish the building, which happened to be a lot around the time when the state would demolish a lot of historical buildings, not only the state, but counties and cities in California. From 1960 to 1968, a group of local women fought to keep it. The state agreed to not demolish the building, but also not to keep the building standing either. The building remained vacant and in disrepair until September 2001, when the Preston Castle Foundation leased the building from the state of California. In 2014, the foundation was granted ownership of the castle and its 12.91 acres of land at this point. The Preston Castle Foundation mission is to preserve, rehabilitate, and utilize the historic Preston Castle site as well as preserving the history of the school and the boys. Today, Preston Castle is open to the public for tours and events. Funds raised are used to restore the building 
and the grounds around to its original beauty. It is on the National Register of Historic Places. Not all was well at Preston Castle. It was a reform school, not a prison. It might have well has been a prison. Discipline consisted of starvation, isolation, public paddling, and lashes, severe strategies that were commonplace in reform schools back then. The outside world didn't see what was going on on the inside. It is said new wards were forced to swim in a small indoor pool of lye. Horrific stories of abuse and neglect became known over the years. Wards died of severe illness, like yellow fever and tuberculosis. Wards were also killed by guards. There's a cemetery on property that houses 23 graves. Individuals who were sent to their Preston Castle graves by guards or illness. They were sent there to be rehabilitated, but now live there forever. There's a story of the head housekeeper, Anne Corbin, who was brutally beaten to death in the basement on February 23rd, 1950. The suspects were never found. Wards and staff were blamed for the murder, but no one ever went to jail or prison, and the murder is unsolved to this day. It has been said that her spirit still resides at the castle, along with the spirit of all other wards and staff who did not pass to the other side. On April 19, 1919, during his third attempt to escape, a Preston guard named John Kelly shot and killed Samuel Goins in the back at age 20 years old. He died two months shy of his release date. Samuel is buried in the Preston Cemetery just outside. Guests touring the grounds since have reported many strange sights and sounds. Slamming doors, flying objects, disembodied voices, and ghostly physical contact. Is it the ghost of Anne the head housekeeper or that of the boys who suffered their untimely death? Number three, Point Sur Lighthouse. The Point Sur Lighthouse. The Point Sur Lighthouse is perched upon the breathtaking volcanic rocky coastline between Carmel and Big Sur, warning nearby ships of the treacherous coastline that awaits them. Truly isolated from the modern world, visiting here is like stepping back in time. No video or photographs can do this place justice. Absolutely magnificently beautiful in person. This section of the California coastline is one of the most treacherous of all of California, dating back to the 1500s when the Spaniards first started to explore California. The lighthouse is now a state historic park and is on the National Register of Historic Places. They offer tours and even moonlight tours in October. They'll even offer haunted tours as well. Lighthouse was commissioned in 1887 and built in 1889. The lighthouse is one of California's most remote lighthouses in all of the state, and the keepers and their families who lived next to it could only get supplies by ship in the very early days. A doctor was a four-hour horseback ride away in Monterey. To leave the lighthouse in the earlier years, residents had to climb down nearly 400 stairs and then trek several miles to a county road. Highway 1 didn't exist until 1937. There was a road built to the top of the lighthouse at one point, and families would use a horse and buggy to get supplies. The last lighthouse keeper left in 1974 after the Coast Guard automated the lighthouse in 1972. The Pharrell lens no longer exists in the lighthouse. The Big Sur Lighthouse has had many fatalities over its years. As many as a dozen or more ships have wrecked along the rocky shoreline below the lighthouse. In 1894, the Los Angeles sank close to the lighthouse. This disaster sadly claimed the lives of six people, including women and children. In 1935, the airship called the USS McGrone precursor to the blimp crash in this area. To say that this lighthouse is haunted is an understatement. Many lost souls from the multiple shipwrecks and past keepers and their families are said to still remain here. 
the light from the lighthouse guiding them back to the shoreline. Many sailors and children have been known to be heard. A tall man in dark blue, 18th century garb, has often been seen lingering around the historic tower. Volunteer Julie Nunes has recorded multiple voices, like a female voice whispering, Now she wants you to go home. Another woman says, Pokey, go to bed. This voice is of Catherine Ingersoll, a Danish immigrant who was married to a lighthouse keeper. She's telling her daughter, nicknamed Pokey, to go to bed. Julie could also hear the faint sound of a little girl's response. Ruth was one of many people who lived in the lighthouse in the century. She is known to hang out in the kitchen area. She closes cupboards and drawers and even will close the doors to the kitchen. A woman in early century dress has been seen in the house and she just disappears. A man has also been seen looking through the windows from the outside looking in, also just disappears. As many as 20 ghosts haunt this lighthouse, 12 have been identified. At one point, the beacon in the lighthouse itself has been seen moving on its own. This is definitely one of California's most haunted lighthouses and definitely worth a visit. Take the haunted tour in October, I dare you. Number 2. The Whaley House in Old Town, San Diego. The Whaley House is considered the most haunted house not only in California, but throughout the entire United States. Thomas Whaley, originally from New York, moved to San Francisco in 1849 during the California Gold Rush, like many other East Coasters. In the early 1850s, he moved down to San Diego to start a new business and to build a home. But in 1852, he witnessed the execution of Yankees Jim Robinson on the land that would become the Whaley House just five years later. The authorities of Old Town San Diego used the land that the Whaley House now sits on for their executions in 1852. Yankee Jim was a little taller than normal people at the time. He was about 6'4 in height. When he was executed for trying to steal a rowboat, he was pushed off the wagon and strangled to death instead of having his neck broken, which is usual for a hanging. They misjudged his height. It is said that Yankee Jim Robinson was supposedly innocent. Even though Thomas Whaley witnessed the execution in 1852, he purchased the land in 1855, and on May 6th of 1856, he began construction of the Whaley House, which was completed in 1857. The home consisted of Thomas's general store on the bottom floor and the family residence on the second floor, which was normal in New York at the time. Just after moving in, the family began to hear footsteps that weren't theirs, heavy footsteps, and Thomas is known to say he believes that those footsteps were those of Yankee Jim, unhappy with the way he was hung, or that they hung an innocent man. It wasn't long after the family moved in that tragedy struck. 18-month-old Thomas Jr. died of scarlet fever. Shortly after that, Thomas's convenience store burned down. Thomas took his wife Annie and their two remaining kids and moved back to San Francisco. When an earthquake in San Francisco brought them back to San Diego, and back to the Whaley House. Thomas created San Diego's first theater in 1868 in one of the bedrooms upstairs in the Whaley House, along with creating San Diego's second courtroom on the bottom floor of the Whaley House, which operated from 1869 to 1871. On January 5th, 1882, Thomas's two daughters, Violet and Anna, both were married inside the home. Violet married George Bartolosi, and Annie married her first cousin, John T. Whaley. But happiness was not long-lived. Violet's husband, George, was a swindler and only married her for her money and status. Wasn't long 
before they were separated and divorced. And for a young woman to be separated and divorced at that time was a shameful thing. She was ostracized by the community and she couldn't take the pressure. She was depressed and full of guilt. So on August 18th, 1885, Violet grabbed her dad's gun, went to the outhouse behind the Whaley home and shot herself in the heart where Thomas Whaley had found her, brought her into the house where she died 15 minutes later. Once again, tragedy had hit the house and Thomas Thomas packed up his family and left the home once again. They built a single-story home somewhere else in San Diego. Thomas Whaley passed away in 1890 of natural causes. The house laid vacant and in disrepair until 1909 when Thomas' son Francis decided to rebuild and reconstruct the home. He lived there until his death in 1914. Other family members who died in the house as well was that of Thomas's wife Anna who died in 1913 and Thomas's daughter Lillian who passed away in the home in 1953. With that many deaths and that much tragedy there's bound to be spirits. Like I said the footsteps of Yankee Jim were heard by Thomas Whaley himself and today if you climb the staircase you may find yourself being pushed back or pushed up against and even bruised by the time you hit the top of the stairs, they believe that is Yankee Jim himself, baby Thomas, who was the first to die in the house in 1857, 1858, had always stayed close by. As reported by many visitors, they could hear tiny footsteps, the sound of him crying, even giggling when no one was there. The house was empty. Others report seeing a young woman lingering on the second floor, believed to be that of poor Violet, still consumed with sorrow. She seems to stay close to the second floor where she spent much of her time after her divorce and before her death. It is said that these areas within the house become quite cold and her presence is felt throughout the house. The second floor is where Violet had her bedroom. Thomas is the only one who did not die in the house, but that doesn't mean his spirit isn't there. Thomas, Anna, and several other spirits spirits have also been felt within the home, on the stairwells, and on the property. Many have seen Thomas dressed in his frock coat and top hat standing at the top of the staircase looking down. Others say that they can smell aromas of French perfume which Anna would wear. It was her signature scent. Mist, lights turning on and off by themselves, crystals in the music rooms, lamps swinging without any prompt, seeing curtains moving even though all the windows are closed and no wind is through the house at all. The sound of children running up and down the stairs without anyone being seen. Footsteps, cold spots, and appearances and disappearances of shadows have all been seen. All signs that the Whaley house is truly haunted, not by just Yankee Jim, but the Whaley family themselves. It is definitely worth the visit. Number one, Colorado Street Bridge, Pasadena. The Colorado Street Bridge in Pasadena is a highly ornate, majestic bridge that was designed and built by Waddell and Harrington in 1913. It took 18 months of construction at a cost of a quarter of a million dollars. It stands 150 feet above the Arroyo Seco. The Colorado Street Bridge was proclaimed to be the highest concrete bridge in the world when it was built. The bridge was part of historic Route 66, only two lanes wide. The bridge was considered obsolete as early as the 1930s, but remained part of Route 66 until the 1940 completion of the Arroyo Seco Parkway. By then, the Colorado Street Bridge had a sinister reputation as Suicide Bridge. Between 1929 and 1933, over 50 people took their own lives, earning the bridge the name Suicide Bridge in 1933. A number of others followed, especially during the Great Depression. Over the years, estimations have put the number of people who have taken their own lives leaping into the Arroyo Seco at more than 100. In 1981, the bridge was listed on the National Register of Historic Places, but was in disrepair. Chunks of concrete were falling from the arches and the railings. After the 1989 Loma Puerte earthquake, the bridge was closed 
closed until federal, state, and local funds provided $27 million in renovation. The bridge reopened in 1993, complete with all its original ornate detail and a suicide prevention rail. That rail has been changed twice now, each time making the fence higher and higher. The first death on the bridge was during its construction in 1913. A construction worker by the name of John Visco fell to his death. Two other men fell as well, but survived. One landed in the trees below, the other landed in wet concrete. Although the man who landed in the wet concrete survived, he did lose a leg and an arm. On November 16, 1919, a 70-year-old Huntington Park resident, Smith Osgood, jumped from the bridge. He traveled to the bridge with the intent on ending his life. As he walked through the lamp-lit pathway, he stopped a passerby and paid him to bring a letter to the police and instructed him not to read it. When Mr. Osgood reached one of the small alcoves at the highest point of the bridge, he jumped. Locals and visitors report seeing an apparition of a woman in a white gown leaping from the bridge but disappearing halfway down. People walking on or even below the bridge hear the unmistakable sound of a baby crying. Among the trees and rocks below the bridge, people report the gruffle voice of a man insisting, it's her fault, it's her fault. There are no reports of children ever dying on the bridge or near the bridge, though the area was home to generations of native people whose burial grounds were disturbed when the bridge was constructed. So if you believe in ghosts, the child that is crying may be that of a native child. In one of the saddest stories, on May 1st, 1937, Myrtle Ward dressed her three-year-old daughter and drove her to the bridge. When they reached the alcove at the highest point of the bridge, she paused long enough to make eye contact with some pedestrians who watched in horror as Myrtle flung her baby over the edge just before jumping herself to the rocky creek below. Fortunately, pepper trees broke the baby's fall. Although the child was hurt, it did survive. Sadly, Myrtle was not as fortunate. Myrtle died a painful death two hours later at a local hospital. The fall had shattered her pelvis and ruptured her spleen. The ghost with a gravelly voice is that of Charles Winkleman, who on August 24, 1934, took a car ride with his estranged wife, Ella. During the drive, he turned on to the Colorado Street Bridge and stopped. About halfway across, he exited the vehicle abruptly and attempted to drag his wife, Ella, out of the car with him. Ella fought back and struggled, was able to break free of Charles, and when she she did, Charles went over the edge. So from now on, Charles is left wandering along the bridge and under the bridge, muttering, it's her fault. There have also been accounts of people seeing a car with headlights driving across the bridge and then just disappearing as it got closer to them. This bridge is truly haunted, but the question is, what makes it that way? And what makes it a prime location for people to take their own lives? Could it be evil spirits? Spirits or something else. That's it for this episode of California Unearthed. Hopefully I gave you just enough information about these 10 places and just enough information on the hauntings to pique your interest on wanting to go visit one, if not all 10, of these haunted locations here in California. I know I'm going to visit, and like I said earlier, I'm going to make a video on each one of these at some point in time. So if you like this content and you want to see more of this, let me know in the comments down below. Smash the like button. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed. And we'll see you guys in another graveyard. Mm -hmm.